Good afternoon and welcome to CMC Markets and this Monday Market webinar dated the 8th of May with me Michael Hewson and this look at the key events for the week ahead but first and foremost before we get started have a quick look at the uh, have a quick look at the risk warning um, which I have to show at the beginning of every one of these events for compliance purposes and uh, once we've got them out of the way we can we can swiftly we can swiftly move forward so any case i think obviously the key events over the past weekend or the past couple of days is the market reaction to the unsurprising result that emmanuel macron was announced winner of the french presidency and markets have i think reacted in a way that really I sort of expected we had we've had two weeks of pretty much expected gains and now what we're seeing is a classic case of buying the expectation and selling the outcome buy the rumor sell the facts so what does that mean for the euro going forward more importantly what does it mean for European equities I think initially what we're probably going to see is a little bit profit a little bit of profit taking um, as I think we digest what ultimately is going to be the effect that a Macron presidency will have on the growth outlook for France, but more importantly on the political outlook, um, the political and economic outlook for the French economy. And now that we've removed completely the tail risk of a Le Pen presidency, markets are now going to be focusing on the next key event. Um, which is likely to detail where the French economy goes to next. And ultimately, that's going to be the June Assembly elections that are going to be taking place um, later this year, in June, actually, in between June the 11th and June the 18th, where there will be elections for the 577 seats in the National Assembly. Now, at the moment, France, um, Emmanuel Macron does not have um, any representation in the French Parliament. Now that could well change and is likely to change over the course of the next few weeks. Um, but what is it, I think what's unlikely is that they will become an absolute majority, given the fact that I think it's very, very new. He's coming from a significant way back. And I think to get a better indication of the type of performance that we can expect to see in the French Assembly, we need to go back to his performance in the first round of the French elections. And the first round, he only really won 24, 25% of the vote. So I think the June elections will be much more representative of what Mr. Macron can hope to achieve than what we saw at the weekend where he won a 66% landslide. And I think what was actually quite notable about the French elections or the second round over the weekend was even though Marine Le Pen only won 34% of the votes. She got 10 million votes. Emmanuel Macron got 20.7 million. What was more telling, I think, was the fact that 16 million votes were either spoiled or blank. So that gives you an indication of the fact that 16 million people were not prepared to vote for Emmanuel Macron. So ultimately, Marine Le Pen did come third behind spoiled and blank. But ultimately, <laughs> they spoiled and, and blank papers only polled 4 million votes less than the actual winner, Emmanuel Macron. So that suggests to me that even though he's won the presidency, the real hard work starts now. And anyone expecting that he will be able to implement his program, his manifesto program, that's going to be a big ask because his ticket is cutting 120,000 public sector jobs, a 60 billion euro cut in public spending, and a lowering of the unemployment rate to 7%. They are the key level, They are the key measures that Emmanuel Macron will be running on. Okay, so 7% unemployment rate. Let me put that in perspective. French unemployment has never been at 7% in the last 30 years. The lowest it's been was at the end of 2008, beginning of 2008, when it was 7.2. Other than that, it's trended at around 8, 8.5%. So he set himself a really, really big bar to clear. So, so what is it? So basically, 
the the he the, you know the outlook is very very the bar is very very high. So let's look at what that means for French assets. We've seen a significant rebound from the from the first round vote higher. We're now getting a little bit of profit taking kicking in. So ultimately, I think the next key support level for the CAC Caron is the previous highs around about 5,280, 5,300. Um, so we can potentially come all the way back there. We are also very overbought. Look at the negative divergence here on the slow stochastic, which means that we could see a significant amount of profit taking. We are very overbought. And to give you an indication of how how far overbought we are, let's have a look at the weekly chart. Let's also have a look at the monthly chart. So the next level, I think, really, for the CAC current, as long as we stay above the previous peaks through here and the previous lows through here, around about 5,300, we can potentially go higher. But we are susceptible to a little bit of a pullback in the short to medium term. And I think the, tr the same is also true of the euro dollar as well. Because if we look at the euro dollar and the way that's behaving in the aftermath of the rally higher that we've seen in the past couple of weeks, this candle here or this bar here is a warning sign that we could actually be near the sh near a short term top in euro dollar. This is a potential potential key reversal day. Now key reversal days generally tend to be precursors to a little bit of a, a setback towards the downside or the upside if they happen at the end of a downtrend. This is happening at the end of a nice little uptrend here. We you know it doesn't it doesn't alter the overall view that ultimately the bias for the euro is towards the top side. But I think if we're unable to close significantly above 110 or even 109 60 70 today then the risk is we could get a little bit of a sell off back to the 200 day moving average that we broke out above um, a few days ago in fact two weeks ago um, we could get a little bit of a pullback here more importantly is what the dollar index is telling us as well in the aftermath of those payrolls numbers that we saw on Friday because this is not a but this is not a binary story it's not euro goes up because Macron wins dollar goes down there's push-pull as well with respect to interest rate expectations on the dollar side of the equation and if we look at the dollar index and let's not forget the dollar index is 57 percent euro dollar we've got a potential bullish reversal on the dollar index as well so if the dollar is able to rally from the lows that we're currently seeing um, over the course of the past 24 hours then that is going to have a drag effect on euro dollar because of the heavier weighting on euro of the dollar index on euro dollar and we can see that if we look at the Bloomberg dollar, if we look at the dollar index on my Bloomberg terminal, which I will show you, which I will show you right now. Let me just pull that over so that you can see it. Um, there we go, US dollar index. Let's go and make that a line chart. Turn it into a candle chart here. Make it year to date. So it'll give us slightly more detail here. So this could end up being a little bit of a a, a little bit of an, a short term low for the dollar index over the course of the next few days need to get back through above the highs for today at the moment which is around about 99 and um, that, that could act as a little bit of a short term base over the course of the next few trading sessions if a big if if we close where we currently are at the moment so what does that mean for euro pretty much across the board. Well, the weakness of the euro against the dollar at the moment doesn't bode well for future gains over the course of the next few sessions. So what does it mean for euro sterling? Now, euro sterling, in the context of euro sterling, it doesn't look particularly positive either. Let's look at these daily candles here. Had a very strong move up. We've had a very strong move up from the lows that we saw in April, but we do appear to be starting to develop a little bit of what I would call a sideways consolidation. So let's basically draw in the lower lines here. Bearing in mind that we've got the Bank of England later this week. Bearing in mind also that we do appear to have started to have broken out a little bit 
of this triangular consolidation that we've been in over the course of the past five or six weeks. Now we have broken down through this trend line support year, but don't get too carried away with this particular euro sterling move because we're still above this key support level that we've got here. So I think in the short to medium term we can drift a little bit lower towards 8405 but I certainly don't think we're going to come crashing off a cliff because later this week we've got the Bank of England inflation report. We've also got um, obviously the rate decision. Now you may recall at the last meeting Kristen Forbes um, dissented from the overall policy and voted for a rate rise. Now I wouldn't read too much into that because she's going to be leaving the committee at the end of June in any case. So I think what will be interesting will be whether or not she gets any other, any more support for her stance for a rate rise, given the slowdown that we've seen in Q1 GDP. Now, we were expecting a minor slowdown from the 0.6, 0.7 that we saw in Q4. The fact that we got a weaker than expected number at 0.3 was a little bit disappointing but it also wasn't altogether surprising because ultimately the, G the GDP number that we got only accounted for around about 40-45% of the data that we saw at the beginning of Q1 and really didn't include and doesn't include the data that we saw in March which was actually significantly stronger. So I think the potential there is for a slightly, slightly higher revision to Q1 GDP which should be broadly sterling supportive. What we've also got is obviously the political machinations going on, you know, the political risk going on ahead of the, the June the 8th general election. But ultimately, I, don't, I think it would be a major surprise if there was anything other than a Conservative win, or should I say a Theresa May win, rather than a Conservative win, because that's what they're branding themselves at the moment, is Theresa May vote for me as opposed to vote for the Conservatives and it's a subtle distinction but ultimately it's it sound, it's it's likely to be a fairly effective one given how toxic the Conservative brand is in some parts of the current uh, some parts of the country so um, looking looking at the outlook for looking at the outlook for the pound I think it's still broadly positive we are finding a little bit of a barrier at 130 but ultimately that is a barrier that I expect to be broken over the course of the next few days and weeks. Once again we are significantly overbought on the daily charts but we go back to this triangle breakout that I was talking about and have been talking about for several days and several weeks. This triangle breakout here if we measure the minimum price objective and we're going to keep going back to this from the breakout point the minimum price objective is 133. So this triangular breakout took place over the course of a three month period. Ultimately what I would expect is over the next two to three months is for us to achieve that target. So for me sterling still remains buy on dips. I think it's only a matter of time before we break through 130. For that to happen we need to stay above this 127.56 area that we've seen over the scene towards the end of April. That's the key support. A little bit of a flag here. We've broken higher. We're still trending higher. We can actually probably drill into this chart here, go on a four hour chart, and potentially draw a line through the lows through here. So let's go and do that right now. Take those lows there, through those lows there, and you've got a nice little upward trend line going through those series of lows from the beginning of April which brings us around about 120, 128.80, 128.70 there or thereabouts. So we could get a drift back down in the short to medium term on the pound, but I think as long as we hold above 128.20, which was the lows that we saw last week, then ultimately the bias towards the upside should remain. Friday's payrolls numbers haven't really changed the calculus with respect to US rate rise expectations. I think we'll still get one this year, really the question is around the timing. Now if you look at the Bloomberg terminal the markets are pretty much pricing in a US rate rise in June. What they're not pricing in is one in September and I would doubt that they're, they're pricing in one in December either. I would expect to see one but I don't expect to see more 
than one. We're already hearing President Trump talking about a government shutdown in September. If that turns out to be the case, the Fed's unlikely to raise rates in September. So if they don't raise in June, they're not likely to raise in September unless he rose back on his comments that the US could do with a good shutdown in September, which is a rather daft thing to say for a sitting US president, but there you go. These are not normal times. So really in terms of US rate rise expectations, Fed officials are talking about the potential for two or three this year. Obviously we saw the one in March. Those payrolls numbers that we saw on Friday to me don't speak to another two rate rises simply because the wage growth that we saw was particularly disappointing. If you're looking to raise rates, what you want to be seeing is an increase in wage inflation. And wage inflation actually showed a significant slowdown from the numbers that we saw in March to from 2.7 to 2.5. So the last thing you want to be doing for an economy that's very consumer driven, as as pretty much like the UK economy, is the US economy is driven very much by consumption. The last thing you want to be doing is tightening credit at a time when wage inflation is starting to slow down because ultimately you could have the unintended side effect of causing the very slowdown that you want to, that you want to avoid. So, so for me at the moment, the, do, the, do, the, dollar, the dollar bull story needs to overcome some significant obstacles and one of which is this nice little move that we're seeing in dollar yen. Now, I talked about this at the payrolls um, on the payrolls webinar on Friday. This big resistance level around about the 113 area. It also coincides with the cloud support on the Ichimoku chart, but also the trend line resistance from the highs that we saw at the beginning of this year. For dollar yen to push higher, and dollar yen tends to be a decent proxy of rate rise, US rate rise expectations, dollar yen to push higher, we really need to gain a significant foothold above 113. At the moment, we're finding support around about 112.20, 112.30, there or thereabouts. We can see that from this, this um, the, the day's lows here, around about 112.39, 112.40. We can drift a little bit lower from that, but certainly if we look at if we look at these peaks here and these lows here, we know that there's a decent area of support between 112.20 and 112.40. So a drop below 112 will probably be, see a significant fall down to around about 111 in fairly short order. Because if you've got a long position in dollar yen, where are you going to put your stop loss? You're going to put it below this series of lows through here. And this is basically what, when you're looking at trading the markets, this this is this is what it's this is what it's all about with respect to finding levels. If you're looking to find levels, then you're looking at the lows of the last two to three days. And I would argue that the lows of the last two or three days here are around about 112. So you've got a potential, you've got a potential double top on the two hour chart through here. So looking for looking for a breakout in this case is fairly straightforward. That's your channel of price action. You can see a little bit of minor support around 12, 112.40, but through 112 you've got a decent area of support, potential double top in place, and a break below 112, which could then signal a quick 100 point move down towards 111. As I say, it's about levels and picking your levels, and for dollar yen, that for me I think is the trade at the moment. Trade the channel until such time as you get a break, and then trade the direction of the breakout. Okay, so let's move on to the Aussie dollar, which has taken an absolute hosing over the course of the past few weeks on the back of a sell-off in commodity prices. And I think this is the one key concern that I have about the, the growth story and the rebound that we've seen in European markets over the course of the past few weeks. All the focus has been on Europe and the decent rebound that we've seen in um, PMI data in the euro area and, 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 and obviously the UK. It's been the slowdown that we've seen in the China data, and we saw that I think borne out in this morning's Chinese trade data. It was still fairly decent in terms of the overall numbers, but I think what was a little bit concerning, I think from from my perspective, 
on this is that when you look at the Chinese import numbers, there was a significant slowdown in the imports from the March numbers. In March, we saw a big jump in imports to 20.3 percent. We still saw a nice little. We still saw a nice jump in imports for April, but it was half the level that we saw in March. And exports were also half the level that they were in March. We saw Chinese exports for April rise 8 percent. They rose 16.4 percent in March. So even though they were still in the positive territory, there was a little bit of a slowdown. And I think a large part, obviously, of that has been the sharp slowdown that we've seen in terms of iron ore prices, which have dropped quite sharply. And let's have a quick look at them on the Bloomberg, because obviously we don't have them here. So if we look at iron ore here, we can have a quick look at the slowdown that we've seen over the course of the past couple of months. And we can see from levels of $95 a tonne, we've come down to $60 a tonne in the space of two or three months. OK, you have to put that in the context of the rally that we've seen since the lows that we saw, the levels that we saw a year ago. But that is a significantly sharp sh slowdown. On its own, I probably wouldn't be too worried about it. But when you also put it in the context of the declines that we've seen in copper prices since February, again, a sharp, sharp decline back to the levels that we saw towards the 200-day moving average. And we're once again, we're lower again today. And the worst performing sector on the FTSE 100 today has been the miners, basic resources, but also what we've seen in Brent crude prices as well. Um, we did see a nice little rebound on Friday. Not really surprising when you consider the extent of the move that we saw over the course, and we've seen over the course of the past few weeks. But nonetheless, the sharp sell-off in commodity prices over concerns about oversupply and slowing demand, there is a concern, I think, that maybe we're seeing the, the beginnings of a little bit of a slowdown, or whether it's just a slowdown before a rebound. As I say, markets can give slightly, slightly differing views of where we are, but certainly I think in, in the context of this decline, it is a little bit worrying, despite the sharp rebound that we saw in on, on, on in oil prices on Friday. What does that mean, I think, for oil prices going forward? Well, I think if we look at the March lows, that was the catalyst for the sell-off that we saw last week. So if we draw a horizontal line through there, then I think for me, we need to get back above this $50 a barrel level and the 200-day moving average to suggest that we're not about to roll over on crude prices. What is a little bit worrying, I think, in terms of the overall crude story, is all the long-term indicators are starting to roll over as well. So you've got the 50-day moving average starting to, to turn over. The 200-day moving average is still positive, but that could start to roll over the longer we're unable to get back above that $50 a barrel mark that we've got that we've indicated here. So that's Brent. WTI tells a similar sort of story. We're already hearing Saudi Arabia talking about extending the output freeze beyond the end of 2017 and into 2018. That in itself should be crude positive, and it's actually not happening. Crude oil prices are actually down on the day. Now we could we could well recover as we go into the as we head into the middle of this week and the back end of the week. But at the moment, markets don't seem overly convinced that we can actually have the legs to move higher. And that is a little bit worrying. Certainly, if we look at the 50-day moving average on WTI relative to Brent, that's rolling over even further. So the outlook for commodity prices looks a little bit weak. And that is a worry if you believe in the fact that commodity price is a barometer of the health of the global economy. So the big question is, is the data that we've seen thus far as good as it gets. And at the moment, the price action for equity markets still looks fairly positive. If we look at the US market in particular, and the fact the S&P is back around 2,400, it's made new all-time highs uh, on Friday in the wake of that payrolls data, which was okay, but it wasn't particularly great. You know, it's around about the average, 200,000. 
Um, what I find a little bit concerning about that payrolls data is the divergence between the March data and, and the data that we saw in April. You can talk about weather-related effects all you like, but the weather-related effects in March didn't affect the ADP numbers, yet they, evoked, they, they affected the PLS numbers. So US markets don't look as if they're going to fall off a cliff, but again, they still look quite richly valued. If we look at the German DAX, again, we've got a significant potential for a little bit of a, a bit of a turnaround here. Um, we opened higher, but we've gone we've gone pretty much we've gone pretty much the other way. So again, I think the daily close here is going to be particularly important in the context of the overall short-term direction. The long-term direction is still positive while we're above 12,400, but certainly this this candle here suggest to me that we could be in for a period of a sideways consolidation and we could have seen the highs in the short term uh, over the course of the, of the next few sessions as investors get used to a new trading range for the DAX. FTSE 100 again we're back above 7300 but this I think is going to be the key level for the FTSE 100 over the course of the next few sessions. This trend line resistance from the peaks that we saw in mid-March. If I can draw that line in there, I would suggest around about 7,350 is likely to be toppy on the FTSE 100. I would suggest that we're probably near a short-term top on the CAC Caron and the DAX, given the way those candles look as, if, look as if they're playing out. And the same sort of applies, I think, for the Euro 50 as well. Before I move on to other markets, does anyone want me to cover anything that I haven't covered already? If you do have any questions, please direct them or please reply to the message that I'm about to send out on the chat right now. So any questions, please reply to this particular message that I'm sending out to you right now. More than happy to answer any questions that you might have. Quickly look at gold. We've seen a little bit of a rebound in gold prices. Um, that's, that's basically because we've come off this key support area of 1220 that's acted as support in the past here. You can see that I draw an awful lot of horizontal support and resistance lines here on my various charts, and there's a simple reason for that. I'm looking for areas of previous highs and lows that have acted as support and resistance in the past simply because they tend to be where the buy and sell orders tend to accumulate on any given market. It's try to keep it as simple as possible. Okay, so I'm being asked about sterling fee wheat. Yep, more than happy to uh, look at that. That has been a significant outperformer over the course of the past few weeks, but we do appear to be starting to trade a little bit sideways at the moment. That there, this candle here, is potentially bearish. What we haven't done at the moment is taken out the previous highs. So I think in the overall context of the peaks at the moment, I think we're potentially near a short-term peak at around about 189. But we're trading in a little bit of a trading range at the moment. Between those, between those peaks there and these lows here. So you've got the potential here for a little bit of a double top, but at the moment we're trading in a little bit of a range with, su with support around about 185.60. Let's try and see if we can determine some, see whether or not we're overbought or oversold. Now the slow stochastic that I generally tend to use is the 10.63 slow stochastic. It tends to be less noisy than others. This is um, it's a rather bespoke one. Usually you have 1066, 533. I use I tend to use a a mixture of the two. So we're going to use 1063. Just going to select uh, to get a little bit of what I would call a little. Try and select the highs and the lows there. Yep. So 189, 185. It looks like we're trading sideways at the moment. Certainly the bias on the daily suggests that the next move could be towards the downside, but certainly on a four hour chart, the likelihood is we'll probably we're probably we're probably near a short term base towards 185.60. So 
So I would still be looking to buy the dip on sterling kiwi while we're above 185, 185.6070 in the short to medium term. Is it a head and shoulders too? No, not really. But that doesn't really matter whether it's a head and shoulders too. What's important, I think, in the context of, is of the measuring objective in how you do it. There is no left shoulder on this, so you've got you've got two you've only got two peaks with with, with a head and shoulders. You need you you need a mountain of price action which is above the shoulder on either side. So, <coughs> oh, you mean inverted head and shoulders? Uh, well, yeah, but head and shoulders is a reversal pattern. It can't really act as a continuation pattern. So, um, it's neither here nor there because ultimately, when you break out of this pattern, you trade the breakout. And the breakout, the distance between the two levels here, 188.90 and 185.60, would be your target to either the upside or the downside. So, whether it's an inverted head and shoulders, whether it's a, a sideways channel breakout, the description doesn't matter. The measuring objective is what matters. So ultimately, if we break out of this sideways consolidation, whatever you want to call it, the measuring objective for your measured move is the distance between the two levels here. And your stop loss then becomes, um, if you break out to the top side, your stop loss comes in inside the pattern. And if you break out towards the downside, again, your measured move is 200 points to the downside with your stop loss back inside the pattern. So... What it, whether you call it an inverted head and shoulders, a double top breakout, or just a channel breakout, your measured move objective is exactly the same. And so is your risk management. So I hope, hopefully, that makes sense. Um, quickly, quick view on dollar CAD, I've been asked. So, yeah, more than happy to do that. That's being buffeted from a slightly stronger dollar and a weaker oil price. At the moment, this is the two hour chart on the dollar CAD, looking a little bit better bid at the moment so let's have a quick look at that I mean I don't I don't think there's any question at the moment we're in a little bit of an uptrend there starting to turn a little bit higher what I would want to see on this chart though is a break back above this little moving average here which has acted as a decent area of support until we broke below it at the end of last week so looking at dollar CAD maybe looks to sell rallies back to 137.20 137.40 because ultimately, I think that we are very much, given this daily candle here, potential for a little bit of a turnover, a weaker dollar, a slightly stronger candidate over the course of the next few sessions. But I would certainly look to be a little bit concerned if we went much above 137.30, 137.40, because this daily candle is very much bearish, which would suggest that we've seen a medium term top in dollar CAD in the course of the medium term. So slightly bearish on dollar CAD in the short to medium term. Um, also being asked my thoughts on German bunds. Um, monthly divergence on bund yields. Are markets beginning to anticipate a position ahead of a table announcement from the ECB this year? I think that's a very fair question. I certainly think with the Macron win, um, expectations around German bunds would be for yields to start to come in. Um, certainly if we look at the Euro Bund here, let's look at that. How soft are yields? At the moment we're in a little bit of a range on this. So in terms of prices, if I look at that there, we're pretty much in a sideways range. Let's look at let's look at German Bund yields. So German 10 year and we will look at that one there and go to the line chart and it's pretty much a similar sort of story I think yields look toppy on German bunts and ultimately I would expect a rebound in prices sell off in yields back to around about 0 0.3 because looking at this I don't expect ECB expectations to change that much. Economic data has been improving in the euro area, certainly on, in terms of French PMIs, they've been outperforming German PMIs. 
but really I think it's a question of how you how you price in inflation expectations and certainly I think inflation expectations given the slide in commodity prices that we've seen over the course of the past couple of months are likely to feed in to a perfect excuse for the ECB to do absolutely nothing so while we've seen a little bit of a taper from 80 billion euros to 60 billion euros a month what you're going to get is that the markets are less likely to trade on yield expectations but yield differential expectations and that more than anything I think is likely to what's going to be basically drive the euro going forward I see no evidence whatsoever that we're going to see a pickup in yields um, on German bonds you might see us you might see yields move slightly more on the shorter end than the longer end so if you look at two-year yields where two-year yields are minus 0.7 you might see a shift there but in terms of long-term yields I'm not entirely convinced that we're going to see a significant increase in 10-year yields um, over the course of the next few um, sessions you might see a change in the two-year more than you would in the 10-year so I hope that makes sense Dan seeing as you're the one who asked the question any other questions on um, anything that I haven't covered thus far okay all right well in that case I'd like to thank you all for um, turning up today um, if you do have any other questions that haven't occurred to you um, tweet me at mhuson underscore at at mhuson underscore cmc on twitter and i'll try and answer them there obviously i can't give you advice but i'll certainly give you a view as to where the key levels are otherwise thanks uh, very much for listening and have a good week trading thanks very much